So it's something to think about as we go through this project. When we're coming up with strategies to improve resilience, let's just not think short term. Let's think how we can build out people in the mid to long term. What can we do now that'll have implications not only 10, 20, 30 years down the track, but really into the future? What can we set up now? What is it that will sustain resilience? What is it that will mean we continue being able to resist shocks even if they become more frequent? One of the great things about the Community Resilience Leadership Project is it's given people and community members a platform to discuss their issues around resilience and to express their emotions around what disaster management is and how it's affected their lives and what being affected by natural disasters has meant for them personally. Uh, and I think we all really benefit from the chance to express ourselves and to feel like we've been heard. Uh, and not everyone has that outlet. Uh, so I think that's why these kind of workshops are really important in order to help communities recover um, and also celebrate their survival in response to natural and man-made disasters as well. This project isn't about giving easy answers, it's about starting to open up people's thinking and give them some initial support. So I'm a strong and passionate believer that if you get people involved and they start talking to each other and they start the long process of recovery. We'll gather around the elders, the aunties, respecters in our community and we will yarn and then the program will unfold. My perspective on leadership is that communities lead. Everyone can make a difference. You don't have to be a member of emergency services to be involved within your community. I wanted to come today to actually network with other key players, key leaders um, across the state and get an understanding of what their perception of resilience is. We're just talking about different ways to interact. I guess as a leader, when you're wanting to enter into a community to affect change. Even if they're not a strong player, how do you keep in contact with them? Uh, we do look to educate and engage the community all year round. We're looking at um, particularly taking some of the community leadership and community engagement ideas and taking it back to community. Finding other ways to live and still thrive. Well, it was the most amazing experience and I've learnt so much and I can't wait to go home and think about what we've learnt over the last six days. It gives you the momentum to want to just keep on getting prepared and inform more people to become resilient. I suppose I think we live in quite a beautiful country and I hadn't really experienced anything like the floods before and it made me realise that things do happen close to home so you need to be prepared and get involved. Um, I don't think Brisbane's the same now or South East Queensland's the same since the floods. It seems like um, an edge has been taken off um, Brisbane and people seem to be more open and receptive. And I think that's because they've been through pain. And even though, like Vicky, not everybody shares that pain um, directly, I think we all hurt because everybody else hurt. Mm. Yeah, and so that's how we've responded. This project was designed in mid-2010 to bring together community leaders from across the community, so not just specific to one sector and not just formal leaders but also informal leaders in the community, to start having some discussions about uh, community resilience and building preparedness uh, for natural disasters across Queensland. Being resilient is being able to recover and respond um, to natural disasters in, the, in this key field that we're looking at. So a resilient community is one that is prepared, 
that knows um, the prevention, knows the hazards and collectively as a community looks at how they can mitigate those hazards. A resilient community is a commu any community that has sufficient understanding, connectedness and resources so that community members, when they're confronted with a loss of any type, uh, whether it's economic or uh, because of a natural disaster, any loss, are able to be supported by their communities so that they bounce forward, so that they are well placed and well supported to deal with their new normals. So for me resilience is an important thing for all communities to, to look at in their prevention, preparedness and response and recovery, but resilience has to be owned by the community. In my mind, resilience builds from the ground up. It's not something that can be forced down from the top. It's something that you build on the existing structures in communities and that's where your community resilience comes. When you do that, you build resilience not just for bushfire protection or flood protection or cyclone protection, but I think those communities actually become able to deal with whatever reverses might come their way. The Resilience Leadership Project covers a really broad uh, spectrum of topics because community resilience is a really uh, holistic approach to uh, looking at disaster preparedness in communities. So it's not just about how can we prepare for and respond to natural disasters, but it's about what makes for healthy communities and looking at how and why healthy communities are better able to cope and respond to natural disasters. The resilience kind of work is slightly different from pure response. It's not just about cleaning the debris and putting things back to place, but it's also what we do throughout the year to build the resilience. It's almost a way of life for people to think that we all now get affected by disasters. So for us, in our case, we, we believe that as an organization that sits centrally, that can actually in, enable that kind of conversation, enable general public to be better educated and enable public to get connected with the agencies that require that engagement. Some of the strongest feedback that I've had from the Resi Brisbane Resilience Leadership Project is uh, people's appreciation of the diversity of the speakers who came to speak to them. I'm Catherine Hayne and I'm the State Coordinator for Resilience for Red Cross in Queensland. My name's Bruce Esplin, I'm Victoria's former Emergency Services Commissioner and now basically working in business for myself. My name's Chris Robertson and I'm from Warwick. I'm a member of the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service in, in Freestone and I'm a VCE or Volunteer Community Educator for that group. My name's Dave Morganti, I'm the uh, Executive Officer of the Brisbane District Disaster Management Group which is based at Alderley. My name's Jenny Shu. I'm the Project Coordinator of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Natural Disaster Resilience Project. I'm Kat and I work for Volunteer in Queensland as the Strategic Communications Officer primarily for the Disaster Resilience Team. Hi, um, I'm Daryl Taylor and um, I live in King Lake in Victoria and um, I've been working for the last uh, best part of the last three years in disaster recovery with my colleagues in King Lake. So I came home from work on Tuesday and my housemates had moved everything from our bottom floor up into our top floor. By Tuesday night the water was halfway through our first story and then we all kind of left at 8 p.m. because we realized we uh, should leave while we could still walk out, like you know, waist high in water. Um, stayed at friends, we came back the next day and it was already up to the, the floor of the second story. So when the waters peaked, it was halfway through the upper story as well. Um, I think really Black Saturday was the, the stimulation for me engaging in the work. I lived in King Lake and um, yeah, we were at home uh, when the firestorm descended on our community. So yeah, surviving the firestorm and uh, you know, participating in the, uh, the aftermath and then the, the rebuilding, kind of renewal, regeneration process uh, in our community has been an extraordinary learning experience. When I first moved to the area I live in in Warwick, um, there were three able-bodied men in the, in the valley and we had a bushfire and basically it is every man on deck. Um, but the reason I joined it was because I've grown up with bushfires and I understand how devastating they can be and if I can help other people and preserve life that's one of my major, major aspects of life.
Disaster management uh, took over from when there was questions inside earlier about state of emergency, which was the terminology used through the 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, there's now the Disaster Management Act, so where we have a disaster, which is a, a significant or serious event that's causing significant disruption across the whole community for an extended period, then, uh, then the state brings in the disaster management legislation, which gives specific powers uh, to response agencies, in particular police, to enable us to, to deal with those disasters. It also puts a framework in place where we coordinate all the other government agencies like health, public works, transport and main roads, Department of Communities, and we coordinate the response of all those agencies to make sure we're meeting the community's needs collectively across the whole of government and not just amongst the individual agencies. And then we also look to get out to uh, opportunities like this to get out in the community and talk to members of the community about how the disaster management framework is meant to work because uh, we can have all the frameworks and things in the world and, uh, and have all that structure in place but unless we get out with the community and let them know how it works and, and who's involved it, uh, it's not going to be anywhere near as effective unless we get it out in the community and get the support across the community. So if we have a look at this pyramid here, at the top is local, uh, whether it be ward officers or you know, incident management teams all across the city are on the ground reacting to response agencies. Queensland Police have almost rewritten the way you use social media to get information to the community. And clearly Council in Brisbane is a big organisation. Then you've got health, they've got all the hospitals, okay? You've got your utilities, so we need to talk to each other, we need power, okay? Australian Red Cross, they're the lead agency in the recovery Evacuation centres, Emergency Management Queensland, we have no command and control. However, we are at times the oil that keeps all the parts moving or the glue to bind it together when it turns a bit messy. Okay? But we are the person who, this person here will look across the room and say, who's funding that? Play on. Okay? Because at some stage, it becomes a cost recovery issue. Okay? Department of Communities, Police, Fire, Ambulance and the SES, okay? In Brisbane there's a dedicated SES unit with 10 groups in it that the Mayor can call on, okay? State Emergency Service through SES uh, and through their webpage have uh, a number of tips and, and guidelines on how you can do that as well and how you can become involved. And Brisbane City Council also uh, on their webpage has some very good emergency management and disaster management tips as well as uh, how you can get involved at a local level in, in volunteering and uh, in supporting your local community in preparing for disasters. The community members in my project really appreciated the diverse angles at which these different speakers came at and their different points of view on resilience and on disaster preparedness. As Emergency Services Commissioner I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time working with communities and to form some pretty strong views about how important it was that communities weren't passive recipients of services but were actually active participants in developing their own safety strategies and I have a great respect for what communities can do to help themselves if they're allowed to do it. The culture that we built over the years was that um, any response and recovery to disaster was something that was seen as a, as a work that's done by a government agency. And that produced some outcomes over the years, but it's also produced a side effect, which meant that um, in many cases, uh, local communities were not taking necessarily steps to think about what they can contribute on a local level. In doing so, we've actually lost some of the normal natural attributes of, 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 of households, of individuals or communities, where the knowledge that you normally hold as in terms of thinking how you respond to any kind of an, a disaster, it's kind of been lost because we've lost, we haven't had the conversations, we haven't had the discussions around it, we haven't had the projects and programs where local communities have that discussion. So uh, I think a lot of what's happened in the last 25 years has led to increasing vulnerability at a community level. People have been comfortable uh, but haven't developed the suite of skills that's necessary to be resilient. Institutions and organisations similarly have been comfortable but haven't developed the necessary skills and resources 
that constitute resilience. Because historically, you know, we all get very caught up in our expertise of what we're good at. And um, sometimes we all go in as like a charger into communities that we you know in my expertise I can solve it. And we forget that the communities are actually the experts in, the, in their field. When people aren't involved in doing their things that are important to their own clean up and their own recovery, they miss the opportunity of the social connectedness and the creativity that comes from the social connectedness in that space. And it's not about helping communities, it's about working with them and being in dialogue. So it's about coming from a position of learning, not knowing. And we need to come together to work together, to collaborate and to look at emerging leaders and, and, and to see how we can build our own resilience and preparedness and how communities can own that process. Because what happens sometimes as experts, if we come in and own it, we walk away once the job is done, but the community won't sustain it because it's not theirs. So I think for me the, the urgency of actually having people in the room is, is learning to how we work together and the benefit, how the, the benefit of both pro, um, partnerships coming together is um, you can't put a dollar on that. We come in with the attitude that they are the experts in their communities. They know the needs of their community and they know what their community needs from other bodies in order to support them. So I've got these guys working on uh, the IAP2 scale of participation. We've been talking about how you engage with communities. So they're working through a sheet that uh, looks at those different levels of engagement, talks about what they're useful for, when are they appropriate, what strategies can you use to engage people at that level, um, and, and what resources you need in order to be able to do that. Well, basically we were saying, um, again, it's to consult with the community and um, see what they've got to say about the matter. Uh, the other thing we were talking about was um, professional services that the local remote regions don't have access to so the discussion um, was about actually mobilising the professional services to those remote regions. This activity was really good to look at what are the positives of those methods as well as the challenges that you can face. Um, we looked at empowering the community as well as working in a collaborative manner. We're considering the recent floods, so it's real life situation and sort of using that experience to try and um, and uh, engendered conversation amongst us all. There's a diverse uh, array of opinions around the table, which I think is good. Um, I think a lot of what we have learnt over the last three and a half days is coming out to the fore, but I just do feel that um, there's still a lot of diversity and a lot of um, degree of difficulty in getting um, consensus. So the participants for the Resilience Leadership Project self-identify as community leaders. We have no restrictions around uh, what their role or uh, their level of activity in community should be. It's really about uh, fitting out those people who are interested in this topic and interested in taking it for further and, and championing that in, back into their communities. I think the inquiry process uh, has more value than the imposition of a model of resilience from the outside. Um, I think by encouraging dialogue, by getting people together from different perspectives in communities, the richness evolves. People will evolve into models like we've evolved in King Lake because we participated in a dialogue about it, because we learned from each other, because we came to it from with a sense of humility and an interest in each other's perspectives, we were able to evolve quite a sophisticated understanding of resilience. And I see that as the incredible value of participatory processes. Um, coming from a <coughs> farming community, which has gone through drought, it's gone through floods, it's gone through house fires, um, you'll find that there are sectors of the community that will always get behind and try and pick up the pieces. And that, is, to me, is resilience within the community. It doesn't always succeed. Um, we have people who, give, who just give up. We have people who commit suicide. We have people who do other things. But um, the community in Australia does have that ability to actually get together and do things for other people who are in less fortunate situations than ourselves. And I think that's why I'm here, is because we need people to actually stand up first and say, what can we do? 
because when someone stands up and says, what can we do, the rest of the community stands up and says, well, let's do this. Yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. When you see what is still yet to be done and how much economic and social and emotional recovery um, is yet to come for so many people after over a broad cross-section, um, I think that's evidence that we're not very resilient because so many people have got so far to go in, in being able to recover from, you know, last year's events. So I don't think we're very resilient at all. Flannery spoke and he showed a picture of a, a village in, in Kenya and he showed a picture of people in Gulbuk. And he said that these two villages had exactly the same amount of normal water use, they had exactly the same amount of water reduction, and that in Goulburn they were trucking in water, and in Kenya they were dying. So this speaks very much to the resilience that we have because we are actually one very large community. And so it's interesting when we look at where we sit on this continuum, it's sort of real as compared to what or to whom. You know, when you have a disaster or an emergency situation, there's two pathways. You can create victims or you can create survivors. And the, the role for government should be to make everybody a survivor. And to be a survivor, you should have the opportunity to form decisions for yourself. It's not the cavalry coming in on their white charges and doing everything for people. It's letting people take their time, do it at the time that suits them, but make decisions that influence the way they rebuild their lives. One of the opportunities that would have been generated had we been able to do our own cleanup was we would have recycled a lot of the material in, instead of it going to dump. We would have also realised that with 770 houses lost, that there was an incredible opportunity to collectively purchase materials, to work on each other's properties, to do these kind of things using social processes, social technologies, not infrastructure-based technologies. So that people, local people's problem solving generates more opportunities for local people. And so as a consequence, community rebuilding could have been both physical and social. I think you know, the benefit for me of what I see as a community development practitioner is that over the six days people come in and they think that they've got their expert hats on and they come in with a role. So you'll have emergency services, you'll have government, and you'll have not-for-profit and then you'll have community members. And actually having them all in the room and actually all getting to talk about how they could work together and what's required in the community puts them at a level field where they can discuss that. How could we work together? How do we look at leadership as being an adaptive tool to know when, when we need to come to the forefront, when do we need to come to the side? How do we engage and excite community and inspire community to, to come together? And leadership plays an important role in that. So this, this training program is a conduit for all of those people, to, all those players to come together and learn from each other and also learn skills and how to communicate and work together as a whole community and not as experts in our fields. What this project really wants to have as, a, as an impact is a range of people working in communities, in leadership positions, whether that's formal or informal, who have this knowledge and understanding behind them and who can uh, take that and use it where it's applicable and take what's uh, important for them and, and use that and champion that in their own ways. I think since um, especially in emergency services we were so heavily um, involved with January on whether it be floods or cyclones or landslides or anything else that happened and it um, certainly made me proud of the fact of everyone can make a difference you don't have to be a member of emergency services to be involved within your community and the resilience that came out of people coming to clean up or help someone else and it's in all my experience, in all the, the meeting with thousands and thousands of people who are angry, who are emotional, where the emotions are pretty close to the surface, they're pretty raw, I think resilience is, resilient communities are informed communities, they're communities who are given the right, honest, open information and they know what to do with it when they get it. And they're communities who know that there's not just one pathway on a journey, sometimes the longer journey, the longer course might actually be the successful course to get to a solution. So, you know, it might just be the shortest, quickest way. Sometimes you might have to take an alternative approach to actually bring about the building and the achievement of a state of resilience within a community. 
So we've had uh, at the Brisbane Resilience Leadership Project, everyone came up and reflected on what they're going to do, what they're going to action out of having been a part of this and it's really been amazing some of the stuff that has come out of this project for people. So whether that's uh, someone finally put together their Stay Go kit so that they're ready for the next storm season to uh, another person who is from a men's shed going out and sending information to all the men's sheds around Queensland about preparedness. So there's a really wide variety of uh, actions that people are going to take out of this that's really going to have impact across a wide variety of communities across Queensland. I found that was excellent because I made a lot of friends and I realise now that there are a lot of avenues that we can use and we should be able to use those. It was eye-opening. I really didn't know anything about resilience before this and so I've learnt a lot about communities and, and what just what we can do. What is one step that they can make towards becoming resilient? Get to know your neighbours. Start small and whatever little step you can make in that right direction, whether it be you know just in your, within your own family or where you have influence in your community. My own idea of community resilience is the fact that we can all work together to create a better community around us and that everyone is able to work in that um, field. Doesn't matter how big or small they are. It's been really interesting getting everybody else's perspectives on uh, especially around community development and engaging community where my experience has been engaging individuals it's nice to get a community perspective. So we have to be very much self-reliant to be able to move forward after a disaster. Just because you're, you're a bit isolated doesn't mean to say that you've forgotten that there are a lot of places in Brisbane, other big areas that you can go to to find out that information that you need. You've just got to be able to ask. Having done the course, I can say it's been extremely informative, uh, very motivational. Um, the two leaders, Tal and Kat, were excellent, very good presenters and uh, facilitators, and the speakers were brilliant. So I'm going out there armed now and ready to save the world. <laughs> excellent, thank you. It was awesome. I can't begin to tell you how much I gained from it. Um, just the wealth of information, the networks, the, the people I've met, the passionate people that I've met. Um, I just, it was really fantastic. And is your home a disaster prepared? My home, my, my personal home? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> it has to be because I can't go to uh, community areas and preach to be prepared act and how to survive in a disaster or a bushfire or anything if my home's not done.